you. So welcome. My name is Patricia Rogers um, and I'm working with the GEI around this issue of how do we embed consideration of environmental sustainability in all evaluations and monitoring systems given the urgency. So I'm delighted to welcome all of you here and those on live streaming to this session and to the panellists. We have three terrific presentations here today. Unfortunately, Yuha Yoto is not able to join us and we're hoping that we'll be able to make his presentation available. So we're going to start with Ilaf Zain, who's going to talk about one project, a climate change project, and talk about some of the lessons from that. Then we'll have Joanna Varela, who's going to talk about a climate change monitoring system. Um, that's in place. So that's expanding it. And then Andy Rowe is going to talk about an evaluation across a portfolio of programs that were not climate change programs, they were not environmental programs, but we're looking at the environmental impact. So it's sort of expanding that. What we're going to do is give each of them 10 minutes to present. We'll have a chance for about five minutes of questions on that. And then at the end, we'll have a chance for some broader discussion. So I look forward to your involvement and Hand over to you, Ilaf. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's me, Ilaf Zain Abdin. Um, I'm an an e officer uh, for a building resilience um, climate change project. And at the same time, I'm a communication consultant for the same project. Uh, in today's presentation, I would like to present and show how good evaluation system can helping us in achieving good results, great outcomes, uh, success stories and lesson learned. So basically the presentation will focus on an implemented project. Uh, it's a climate change adaptation project uh, in Sudan. So I'm going to mention what has happened in the evaluation, what method did they use, and then I will share a success stories as a result of this evaluation. Okay, so I choose to talk about this project because the number of positive feedbacks uh, from communities also because um, I did a post evaluation for this project as a part of my master's degree. Um, Sorry. Oh, As a part of my master's degree, and I, I have, um, I have a lot of, of of information about this project. So basically, let me give you a small details about the project. The project call it an implemented, implementing priority adaptation measures to build resilience of frame fit, frame fit farmers and uh, pastoral communities. The period of uh, implementation was from 2013 to, to 2016. And um, the partners are the GIF, uh, the Higher Council for Environment, and also uh, the UNDB. So let's move to the evaluation part. Um, so it's not the final presentation. No. No. Yes, yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, in terms of Patricia. 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 Yeah, Patricia. What? Uh, yeah. We don't have the final uh, presentation. No. Oh, you sent it to me. You didn't send it to them. No, I sent it to them. No, as well. yeah. no, I wasn't sent. I wasn't uploading them. I didn't realize you okay, sent it to I, me. Can I continue? Yeah, have... I think just continue. Okay, just continue. You have your. I have to download my email. No, I didn't oh, realize it's my job. Okay. So. Oh. Are you are you okay to talk with us? Uh, yeah, it's fine. So it gets, because you've got the script. Okay, yeah, that's the main thing. Thank you. Okay, let's me continue because we don't have the slides for the presentation. So let's move to the evaluation part. Before the term and evaluation of the project, the project team conducted a perception survey. And the perception survey uh, can be defined is as a research study carried out to understand 
uh, the opinion of the target audience, be it employees, customers, beneficiaries, or even patients. So when the project staff decided to use this method, they put it a number of objectives. These objectives are first assess the community perception on the implemented activity by the project. And secondly, examine the effectiveness of the project activities on building resilience and adaptive capacity of rural communities. And finally, understand lessons learned and best practices from beneficiaries point of view. So moving to the data collection tool, the methodology of data collection has utilized Kubo Toolbox, which is a free open source for data collection and it is available to all. However, it allows to collect data in the field using mobile devices such as phones and tablets. So uh, moving to the level of perception, the cross-sectional survey has measured the level of perception of project beneficiaries. In addition, the level of perception part in the survey has four direct questions to uh, to um, question to which the interviewees has responded in a rating scale, multiple choice, and also one answer type of question. The rating, was, the rating was based on a scale from one to five, which one is uh, strongly agree, two is uh, agree, and, this, and the third one is don't don't know, uh, the, fourth one, the fourth one is strongly disagree, and the final one is disagree. Type of questions they ask, um, I have benefited from the project, and the second one, I'm satisfied with the level of improvement. The last question was, women have benefited as much as men. So, yeah, we can see here what uh, the survey helped in achieving the result below. As you can see in the slide, uh, what has been worked well in from the project, improving the access to reliable, clean, and abundant water by entering new water sources such as water yards, um, hafirs, and also sand dams, introducing drought resistant varieties of animal and crops. And about 3,500 have already uh, been reached. 50% of them were women. Capacity building for the targeted community by awareness and training campaigns. The capacity building was not only for communities, but was also for the project staff. And one of it was training of m and &E concept of results. Raising awareness of women group in the area of, uh, of the importance of forest cover in compacting desertification and the impact of climate change, home nurseries, horticultural seedings. And the final one was lessons learned and emerging best practices has been captured, documented, and disseminated. Here, I would like to share these success stories as a result of this evaluation. Uh, so basically, the project focused on improving the livelihood of women, raising their awareness and empowering them. Therefore, the change and the improvement of women's lives was great in economics, social, environmental, and health terms. Let's start with the, eco, uh, with the economic benefits. The income of women increased as a result of increasing in agricultural livestock production since they, stayed, uh, since they started to use the improved seeds, their livestock, their livestock were vaccinated and giving supplementaries. Sorry, supplements. At the end of at, at the end, the income for some farmers increased by 400%. Moving to the social benefits, women have become more vocal and active in the village development meeting, community events, their participation become more and they had a voice. I remember when I talked to the uh, project man manager about this, he mentioned that women, um, uh, he mentioned that women were not participated as well as men, and, and also they refused to talk even to the female project teams. Another one is to save time because they, have, they are having a water source inside the, inside the villages and they don't have to walk for a long distance. The final one is environmental and health benefit. The project provided the women with uh, and gas units in order to reduce health hazard and minimize the use of firewood. 
let's move to the challenges of evaluation in Sudan. First of all, the political challenge in the current unstable political condition in Sudan, weaknesses of government institution, and especially the uh, environmental one, although there are laws, no implementation happens. The conflict related to, lazy, to leases of land to foreign investors, shortage of supporting policies legislation, environmental challenges, the use of biomass for domestic energy, shortage uh, of uh, environmental data and lack of and lack to use existing data academic research gis mapping social social uh, challenges migration problems due to seeking for job opportunities resources resources based conflict especially in the west part of sudan i have some recommendations here uh, so let's conclude with the recommendations improve the environmental governance system and increase the level of cooperation between different partners, enhance the knowledge of the community and indigenous people and try to engage them and using their knowledge and local skills because they know more about their areas. Evaluation must be done by internal external evaluation and communities groups. Partner, partnership with local institution can expedite the evaluation process. So that will be all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for walking us through a really um, interesting project that's grappling with many of the issues that we've, we've been discussing. And apologies for the glitch with the slides, very nicely handled. Um, this is where you have an, an opportunity to ask a few questions about the specific presentation and I, I was particularly struck by the sort of recommendations that came out of that around the importance of partnerships and um, involving a range of people there in, in doing the evaluation which really leads I guess to the question that, that I'd like to ask out of that what do you think really helps with making this data use, used useful and used for decisions and actions you know what were some of the things that that you think really help that from this example. Um, okay, thank you for the question. I think the most important thing is to use the participatory uh, M&E uh, approach in order to engage all the stakeholders, multi-sectoral, regional, federal, and all the communities, uh, because this will help in resulting pot up uh, and regionally, regionally led collaboration in addition to this uh, through the engagement and commitments of partners we'll, we will achieve a good practice for coordination and continuous of knowledge of, uh, and data. Thank you. Are there some other questions that people would like to raise at this point? Uh, comment some of you for some of you you might already be working in these types of uh, projects or overseeing them others might this might be a, a whole new experience to think about how you might go about this uh, that you might like to ask about or offer a comment please thank you just start uh, you want to just grab a mic and just introduce yourself and where you're from yeah uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Laura Fantini and I'm an independent consultant. A uh, very quick question. I want to ask if the success stories you uh, you showed us uh, are they were some expected outcomes of the project or you um, had the opportunity to see that they were somehow unexpected. So um, this is my question. If it's in the boundary of the project, uh, that you raised up this success story, so it was something surprising you. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your question. So the project um, has a number of objectives that made in the beginning of the project. And at the end of the project, the project succeed uh, in achieving these, pro uh, these, uh, these objectives and also uh, for the success stories as well. So these uh, success stories was part of the project uh, uh, yeah, objectives. Thank you. Uh, is there another comment or question people would like to raise? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back at the end and pick up some cross-cutting issues and revisit that. Um, so I'd like to move on to Joanna Varela. Jo Joanna will be presenting in French. If your French is not that good, this would, might be a good time to put on a headset, me included. 
Joanna, you, this is your, your, your sister. Thank you. Vous pouvez utiliser celui-là ou celui-là, vous voyez, et comme ça, c'est pour avancer euh, dans la présentation. C'est bon, c'est celui-là. Bonjour à tous. Euh, je m'appelle Joana Varela, je suis du Santo Mécusipe. Euh, avant tout, je vais parler de mon pays, la sa localisation géographique. Euh, saint tomé principe est situé à l'océan Atlantique. Ça va? Oui, seulement. Oui. Sinon, les, les interprètes ne peuvent pas traduire. Ah, doucement. <rire> non, 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 doucement, ça, ça va. Vous, vous parlez doucement, c'est seulement dans le micro. Ouais, ça va. C'est bon. Merci. Oui, comme j'avais dit, euh, pour commencer, je vais parler de saint tomé principe mon pays. saint tomé principe est situé au Sonia Atlantique, à 300 km d'ouest du Gabon et 240 km d'Afrique centrale. Elle est constituée pour les îles principaux, la île de saint tomé et la île de Principe et beaucoup d'autres îles très petites non habitées. Elle est d'origine volcanique et occupe une superficie de 1100 millions de kilomètres carrés. Sa population est d'environ 220 000 personnes. Santo Mei Principe est l'un des plus petits pays du monde, le second euh, en comparé, à part, depuis les îles Seychelles. Toutefois, il est vulnérabilité à changement climatique. Euh, Sainte Méprix constate déjà la diminution de la pluie, la perte de biodiversité, la pollution des fleuves, l'augmentation des régions costières. Euh, l'inondation, l'augmentation du niveau de l'eau de mer. L'extraction légale de bois pour la construction et pour causer les euh, aliments, ça fait part maintenant de la situation que nous trouvons. Ça veut dire qu'il menace le climat. Euh, Néanmoins, Saint-Omé n'est pas un pays qui fait une grande émission de dioxyde de charbone à cause de sa forêt. 60% du pays est couvert pour les forêts et 30% c'est des zones protégées. Des zones protégées. Euh, mais continuons. Compte tenu de la situation de euh, pas amélioration de la situation climatique, on a fait la suivi, la validation, et on a constaté que de jour à jour, les choses se détériorent. Continuons que saint a assigné la plupart de la Convention des Nations Unies pour euh, le changement climatique, il a demandé aux partenaires de puissent les aider à faire une planification pour euh, puisse combattre les effets, combattre et adapter les effets climatiques. Nous avons reçu des spécialistes qui avaient travaillé sur nous. Il nous indiquait les pas que nous devons faire. On a devoir commencer pour la planification, mise en œuvre, coordination, surveillance et évaluation. Pour la planification, on a appliqué, on a construit un système national de planification et les instruments. Voilà. 
et les instruments de planification avec tous ces, les articles qui sont nécessaires pour avoir un système de suivi euh, avec la participation de tous les acteurs politiques, des gouvernements, des organismes euh, civils, des organisations civiles. Euh, en installer la direction de planification comme un organe responsable pour la programmation, élaboration et de coordination des instruments de planification. Pour la mise en œuvre, pour question spécifiquement de, de climatique, on a créé le Comité national pour le changement climatique qui réunissait les trois, trois mois après d'avoir aussi les points focaux dans ces services qui travaillent directement avec les problèmes d'équipement. Et une fois pour, pour année, les ministres d'infrastructure, donc qui traitent des problèmes de climatique, participent de ces réunions. Il fait des, des rapports trimestriels et envoie aux partenaires de la situation que nous sommes. La coordination. Nous pouvons dire ici que Saint-Thomé et Principe a rejoint rejoint le partenariat, partenariat par série nationalement de féminines. Ça veut dire que Saint-Thomé a néanmoins d'être un petit pays qui n'y pollue comme les autres. Il a pris la décision de pouvoir aussi participer dans l'amélioration du climat. Euh, La parcerie NDC a fait sa première mission en 2007. Il avait nous aidé à préparer un plan de mise à œuvre de parcerie nationalement déterminée qui sont mes prises. Et saint mépris a fait des efforts de mise à œuvre euh, des énergies propres pour lesquelles une plateforme de coordination a été mise en place. On fait l'évaluation du potentiel électrique et établissement d'objectifs, des trajectoires, des mesures et des programmes, opérationnalisation de la plateforme de données et du SAT du Comité national du changement climatique. Le contrôle et évaluation est implanté, comme j'avais dit, parce que nous avons implanté des points focaux. Et il y a une coordination, il y a une réunion trimestrielle avec les directions générales de l'environnement, la direction nationale de planification, qui est auprès du ministère des Finances et de l'économie blé, et le comité national du changement climatique. Les rapports d'avancement périodique trimestriel annuel sont faits sur l'action pour le climat et les parcelles NDC, les communications nationales à la Convention cadre des Nations Unies sur le changement climatique, les inventaires des gaz en effet de pauvre et les rapports biennaux de mise à jour. Tout ça s'est implanté, implanté dans le pays. L'évaluation de la mise en œuvre des parcelles porte en tout sur l'amélioration de la rédévabilité dans l'utilisation des ressources et la génération de connaissances dans les domaines climatiques pour la prise de décisions. Enfin, nous pouvons dire que c'est important d'avoir euh, l'évaluation, un système d'évaluation impliquant tous les gens, tous les États, tous les niveaux 
de serviço que nos permite salvar um homem, identificar o que é necessário para melhorar, ao fim de prise de mesuras próprias para melhorar, para melhoração da situação. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. That was um, you spoke about one of the issues. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. I could hear it really well through my headphones. <laughs> um, you spoke to one of the issues that again had been raised in the plenaries about the responsibility for mitigation and adaptation, and and how all countries, I guess. Have a responsibility to report on these, but that there's some very clearly different differential um, contributions to the current situation. Um, I was very in, very pleased to hear about the how the it's the coordination and coming together that really helps take this forward, and how you see evaluation as being critical to find where things are not working and how they might be addressed. Do you want to just offer any insights about what you think really helps in terms of supporting that use of the of the information? Oui, merci, Madame. Uh, à cause des informations uh, qui est partie de l'évaluation, uh, nous obtenons uh, comment? Nous prenons aide des pays, euh, des organisations qui travaillent sur le climat. Oui. Il y a des effets déjà, il y a euh, aide en ce qui concerne des, des lois pour bien organiser. Il y a, euh, par exemple, euh, des zones poussières, hein? qui est au bord de la mer. Hein? Ils vivent les, les gens là. Ils ont déjà aidé à remplacer ces gens à notre place qui est plus sécurité. Donc, on, touche, on trouve déjà les effets d'avoir une évaluation qui, ou, ou qui montre la situation du pays en ce qui concerne le changement climatique. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other comment, uh, questions or comments about this, uh, this example? Um, again, we can pick up some broader issues um, after we've had our third presentation. So I'd like to hand over to Andy Rowe, who's going to talk about a very different type of evaluation, a retrospective evaluation. Um, across non-environmental programs. Um, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And it is uh, tremendously encouraging uh, that, uh, that evaluation is, uh, is recognizing the connection, the coupling of human and natural systems and uh, making serious strides towards incorporating that coupling of human and natural systems in, in our evaluation work. And as Patricia said, our, our position is that it should be included in all evaluations, regardless of whether they had uh, environmental or sustainability outcomes or not. And the, the reason is that wedding cake picture of the SDGs as opposed to the, uh, the sort of uh, what rectangular square box cluster them together with no, no, no connection between them really, and what the wedding cake version from the Stockholm Resilience Center, but you can see at UNEP and other organizations different versions, is that the natural system is the foundation for all of the human SDGs for everything that humans do. We draw from and we deposit back into the natural systems. Well. If we are excluding natural systems from evaluations and recent UNAIC uh, 
uh, work shows that we are systematically excluding natural systems from evaluations. And if we look at the trend, the environmental trends that are going on and the backsliding, then you can say that quite a bit of what we do is harmful to natural systems. Then you could go to the logical position that evaluation by ignoring natural systems ignores direct negative effects. And in that sense, evaluation is concluding much more optimistically and encouraging the continuation of interventions that are harmful to the natural system. that are in fact accelerating the decline, the climate crisis, the sustainability crisis. So I think that organizations, UN organizations, UNDP, FED, uh, UNEP and others, uh, FAO, taking these strides and incorporating uh, natural systems into their work are recognizing the need to start getting much more valid and reliable uh, evaluations that will help us address both human issues, very pressing human issues of inequality and bias and exploitation and development, and natural issues that will allow us to continue to address those human issues. And they are intertwined. I don't have time to go into that. I want to make two acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, I come to you from the west coast of Canada, which is the uh, traditional lands. Sorry, I, I tear up when I think of what we've done. The traditional lands of the Coast Salish Nation, where I'm, uh, and the unceded territories of the Coast Salish Nation, where we're privileged uh, to be. I also want to acknowledge that the focus of our work is on development. Therefore, the focus of our work, trying to bring sustainability into evaluations, uh, has a focus on places and people uh, that did not are not by and large causing the problem. We don't do, and as the FAO speaker said today, uh, we don't turn the same lens on the countries that Patricia and I come from, to the northern countries, and we need to. Uh, but today I want to I want to focus on on this and uh, go on to the next slide. Okay. All right. Could you help me, please? <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Hey, look, it's a sign from the universe. We cannot rely on technological fixes. <laughs> right? We've got to rely on each other in cooperative relationships. Okay. Good. Thank you. Can I leave it to you? Can I? <laughs> this will work. Uh, I'll, I'll okay. mess it up. There we go. Uh, I was recently a member of a, the evaluation team that conducted a thematic evaluation. You see it titled there. And uh, I was part of the design team. And I think there was a very indicative, profoundly indicative thing that occurred during the design. Because the initial design was going to look at adaptation in favor of smallholders, smallholder adaptation to livelihoods, to gender, uh, to the value chain, and things like that. And I made a simple comment. And I don't want to be the center of that, but. By making a simple comment, what about natural systems? What about sustainability? The response was, good idea, let's do it. The response wasn't, that's not in our remit, that's not our accountability, that's not our structures. The world is changing so rapidly that the, the agendas we're talking about in sustainability are very much on the table. And so let's get going, let's go going with it. And I think that this excellent evaluation with an excellent team, led well, well-resourced, provided or provides proof of concept that it isn't all that hard to do, that we can do it with our existing capacities, tech, technical knowledge, uh, social knowledge, process knowledge, uh, et cetera. So that to me is the main takeaway. This was the methodology we used, and you can see by the highlighted yellow, we included a, uh, a special study. We did three thematic learning studies, uh, and the sustainability study was one of them. And the whole evaluation provided 
included the provision of information for all three thematic studies, as well as special undertakings. So it was conducted fairly seamlessly as part of the, of the whole evaluation. It used all of the normal information gathering that you would have used if you weren't looking at sustainability. It just added a bit for each one. And the sample was quite robust. We're dealing with 20 country case studies. That's quite a, a robust sample. So we just built questions and in sort of considerations in. I will say that the team, the evaluation team, had individual capacities that included natural systems, a pastoralist who knew about pastoral landscape and pastoral farming or agriculture, for example. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> uh, we introduced, because uh, when the team leader, uh, Nancy, said, yeah, let's do it, he also said, can we do it? And my response was, I think so. I'm pretty sure we can. And we did. Uh, and what we did is we developed a topology that really portrays where we've been and where we need to be in terms of natural systems. It also portrays where we've been and where we need to be in terms of human systems, in terms of inequality. We have to move from real exploitation up to restor restorative actions that restore things. So this topology uh, became quite central. It became the the sort of uh, synthesis that we used to synthesize all the documents that we had and all the discussions we had. I won't go into the details of the process, but basically it was a consens consensual process, first amongst the study team, and then over increasingly broad circles with the uh, country and, and regional offices, and then with the evaluation office, of course, and then moving up through uh, IEO until we reached uh, through uh, EFAD, till we reached the position where we were confident that our observations were were accepted in the organization, that we didn't have holes or gaps. And at one stage, someone pointed the the Egypt project that we had graded uh, a certain way uh, was inappropriate because we had the water source wrong. That was great. That corrected things, and we changed it immediately. So this topology became quite central to our to what we observed and i really want to focus you on the right hand side is that approximately 25 percent of efad country endeavors were either no longer harming natural systems or contributing to the restoration of natural systems and there are other other country efforts and other projects that we that came to our attention that are quite heroic and quite quite pathbreaking in the terms of their restorative actions on the landscape that will also be addressing the major problems faced by smallholders. And that phrase is really important. They're restoring the natural systems that are essential to smallholders, farming, and populations as a mechanism, as a means to addressing livelihoods, to addressing gender, to addressing all of the the issues that we normally deal with. And that's there in one of, one of, the, one of the boxes on that. Uh, and I, I have heard that from the Sudan presentation very much, is that you really, that what we find quite systematically is if you lead with the natural system and you respect the urgent needs of the human system by trucking water or whatever, whatever you need to do, then you can reach a place where human and natural systems can be restored together. And that's, that's a finding from this evaluation, but also from, from other evaluations. And it's a, a, a quite a different perspective than what we normally take. There are some things that need to be there. We're look, we look for a lar larger scale farm, farm level will not do it. Ecosystem will usually not do it. You need to be larger landscape, that sort of stuff. And there are certain types of intervention that you need in agriculture that will do this. Things like climate smart agriculture, drip irrigation are not enough. You need to go further. Drip irrigation still draws from aquifers. It still depletes the water supply for humans and for production, et cetera. We need to restore those aquifers and, and water systems. So I just want to flag, to my mind, this was the first major evaluation that ever incorporated 
a look at both human and natural systems. And I think it's a credit to the evaluation managers, the, the original one and subsequent one uh, who are in this room that, that we were allowed to continue with that and that we had the resources and the patient and the political capital to withstand all the discussions with critical reviews with management, et cetera, so that the findings still stand. Ah, briefly, everywhere. We need to put this everywhere. WASH programs, what is WASH for? Sanitation and water, natural systems. How can you evaluate a WASH program without considering the effect on natural systems? Plastic bottles, how can you uh, evaluate uh, let, let's just, I'm not picking on World Food Program, but World Food Program uses a lot of plastic. Their procurement should be, their evaluation should be looking at procurement so that the plastic they purchase is made from recycled plastic, not from raw petroleum. It's a very simple thing. It's a minor cost, but it's, it's part of the job of evaluation to make sure that the entire chain and then the landfills that are created by our emergency are, are appropriate and are managed appropriately, et cetera, that we don't, in our treating of absolutely urgent and desperate human problems, we don't pass the buck to the natural system and leave the damage there. So I think there is a, a, a very strong uh, argument for looking at sustainability and uh, inequity in human systems together, not separating them. It isn't either or. We need to adopt a, a, a worldview that, that seeks win-win. And the evaluations need to take a position that win-win is possible, rarely done, but that should be our standard. We shouldn't be just saying, well, there was an improvement of this much in human and uh, you know, yes, there was damage to natural systems or improvement in natural systems by this. Did they seek win-win so that they were optimizing, doing their best job on both? And can they make a judgment using that topology or something else that actually tells us how much harm or how much benefit is being done? Footprint evaluation uh, uh, exists. Uh, I think we're in year three. We're funded by GEI uh, primarily. Uh, and uh, we've, if you go to our website, you'll see a guidance document such as this, uh, sort of advising or suggesting how you, how you might start incorporating this. You'll soon see uh, work on the topology. You'll see some case studies there. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see a discussion group and, and things like that there. So we aim to be a resource, not the resource, but a resource that complements all the efforts that you're doing and that uh, colleagues at the, at the table are doing in order to bring sustainability in the natural systems. Our theory of change is basically, we're not gonna spend time arguing that you should do it. We're going to meet those who want to do it and are doing it with some stuff that will help them do it and with a community that they can share uh, within and work within. And another tool you'll see is how we've ad adapted the most recent version of the OECD DAC criteria and done what it says should be done, right, explicitly in the, in the impacts statement, that it should be incorporating natural systems throughout. It's not that hard. You know, people often talk about the barriers to commissioning. OECD DAC should be interpreted in a way that says we should be dealing with both systems. We have things up there called key evaluation questions, because when you go from criteria, then you go to questions and you end up with 50, 80, I've seen 120 evaluation questions on some evaluations. We need a handful, that's all we can really do deal with. And the key evaluation questions allow you to either initially approach through the KEQs, but probably interpret the, the OECD DAC into questions that will actually help you get to natural systems. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for joining this session. Thank you to uh, everyone who's participated in this voyage of the last 10 years or so. It really, I am really uh, touched by where we are now compared to where we were 20 years ago. Thank you.
Uh, just add a personal note. I mean, I was inspired when Andy came out to Australia and spoke at the Australasian Evaluation Conference and just we all just went, oh, my gosh, we have to do something. And it's been a real privilege to work with him and the rest of the team um, on, on how we can do it. So before we'll have a chance to have a broader discussion, but I'll give you an opportunity if you've got some particular questions who would like to raise some questions so at the back. I'll just take a couple. One at the back. Anyone else who'd like to? make a comment at this stage. So I'm going to ask you some hard questions in a minute. So we'll start at the back, please. Oh, you'll need a microphone. Yes, please. And you're going to speak in English because I need to get my headsets ready. Yeah. Nope. Good. All right. Thank you, um, Andy, for your presentation. Um, thank you also for your land acknowledgement. I'll take time to do one myself. Um, my name is Isabelle Mercier. And I live and work in Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded territory of the um, Ashnabe people. Um, I'm really interested in this. One of the questions I have um, is that uh, develop any intervention usually just doesn't happen in, in, in a void, right? We, we arrive and there's practices that are in place and and we're trying to change them, right? Um, and I wonder how you treat this idea of a baseline. Um, you know, are some interventions doing better than what the alternative was before the intervention happened? Um, do you look at that or do you start with this idea that we'll look at our intervention, uh, whether or not it's replacing worse practices and we'll just assess our, our intervention as having to be completely sustainable itself? Or do you start with a baseline of, well, here's where we were and after our intervention, we're doing better on these fronts. Um, and in which case, how do you get that baseline data? Because it's usually absent. Um, thanks. Um, I think there are a number of issues uh, uh, you're raising. In, uh, in a typical development project or program, uh, there will be uh, a requirement in the in the design uh, to uh, talk about climate. Is that a climate vulnerable thing? And that's sort of a checkbox thing. Uh, to do another checkbox on social, environmental, and economic uh, CCAP uh, criteria, and that's just usually a checkbox uh, thing too. And the the result is is that um, often when you look at the at the design you say, this is gonna really be harmful. You can see it right from the outset. And the problem is, is the design and the processes used to negotiate the intervention and the trade-offs that, that occur within that. Um, so what I would really like to see is evaluative thinking, looking at both uh, environmental sustainability and inequity and the other human system issues uh, put into, uh, I would say, operations. So it's there as part of the design much more seriously, but on the first uh, supervision mission or whatever it might be called, usually at year one, it's there and it's very hard because there's a chance to change the design at that point. Two or three years down the road, it, you know, you've, you've already committed most of the resources. You can't, you can't shift. So I would like to see that, and that would provide the baseline. I would like to see more uh, uh, in the approval process for projects or the review and approval. I would like to see uh, uh, more insistence on substance instead of checkbox on, on the on these things, uh, which would contribute to a baseline. And then, then the the final uh, final thing, and there, I think there's something that Patricia can comment on quite well in terms of information sources, et cetera, from one of the case studies that we've done. Uh, but um, uh, we need all methods. You know, I, I've been using the phrase, all hands on deck, everyone to the nexus, nexus being human and natural systems where they, where they couple. We need all evaluation methods there. And some methods uh, rely or need a counterfactual, some need uh, before and after baseline and subsequent change. Uh, the topology we use is more of an absolute thing. At the end of this this project, is is this is this project harming the natural system or not? 
And that's something that can, it was designed that way because something that can go forward into the, the, the actual assessment. You could use that topology and the rubrics that we're developing for it to scale it down for all size projects in all sectors can be used to actually judge from the outset the prospects for that project and enter into the negotiations. So I think, I think your question is superb and it, it touches on a number of fronts uh, that are quite important and things that we need to change. The, the metric I use is 2030 is eight years away. The typical development project is five to seven years before an evaluation is done. So anything we're launching now is gonna be evaluated in 2030, by which time we will have crossed thresholds, which we can't come back from. So there is an urgency that really should be taking priority over uh, fidelity to evaluation methods. We need more nimble and honest uh, approaches, I think. Oh, a question, a question at the back, yeah. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Monica Lomeña from the um, Independent Office of Evaluation of IFAT. Um, I wanted to get your views about the practical um, constraints that we have to really implement this thinking, because I think we can have the thinking from the evaluation side and from the design side. But then we go to the countries and we have a minister, Ministry of Environment dealing with certain issues, Ministry of Agriculture dealing with other issues. And as you know, the incentives sometimes are like even contradicting. Even within our, our organizations, we are trying to go forward for more integrated approaches. If and now is mainstreaming gender, youth, nutrition, and climate. But then sometimes you find that in a project, the person dealing with climate or environmental issues, it's a social scientist <laughs> or the other way around because of budget constraints. So I wanted to get your views about, it, it's it's also our trainings no, in the university, like uh, very few of us have a very kind of broad training and then you are considered not an expert of <laughs> anything in, in specific. So I wanted to get your views about how to overcome this in practice with the systems we are operating in both in the countries and in the international organizations that um support uh, these countries thank you but when i had that slide of the topology i pointed your attention first to the right hand side where 25 percent of your projects are doing better than do no harm it's not just scraping into do no harm there's actually restorative elements and there were other projects that weren't part of the sample for example a very large project in northeast brazil that is fairly firmly on the restorative ground or some of the uh, Great Green Wall projects in sub in Sub-Saharan Africa are really part of the restorative efforts. Uh, projects in Kenya that take a whole watershed approach to restoration. These are all IFAD projects. They got negotiated. And they couldn't have been easy to negotiate because G Green Climate Fund was often a, a partner. The national government or state governments were, were partners. So it wasn't you know, it wasn't, couldn't have been an easy negotiation. And uh, what, we, what we recommended, um, and I don't really believe it was well received, uh, is that EFAD has the knowledge and the capacity and the people and the experience to horizontally train through the organization. You've got successes that are achieving wonderful things. So use that. Don't don't try and bring this from outside. Use it internally where people can share, where you know it's safe to ask questions. How did you do that? I had this problem, that sort of stuff. So I think that I think part of it is a worldview a, or a mindset. First of all, a worldview that natural systems matter, they have value. And secondly, a mindset that isn't either or, it doesn't say we can have development or gender or sustainability or or reduce inequality that says, we need it all. We need these things together. So it looks for these win-win solutions. And that's exactly what IFAD staff have done in country and in regions uh, uh, throughout, throughout the globe, but particularly in Latin America, South America, where that type of process is well-grounded. And in 
sort of, let, let's just say Central Africa, where, where it's working really well. So you, you have it, you have the knowledge, you have the experience, you have the demonstrations. Thank you. I'm very keen to have some broader discussion about this. Um, because I think the big questions is, is Indran, did you want to make a comment before I, I launch? Go, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Indra Nadio, IOE Director IFAD. I had the pleasure of tabling the report to the Governing Council and the Board and was extremely well received for its comprehensiveness, its strength of methodology, and we received extreme, uh, very, very strong statements from across the entire spectrum. It comes back to the issue when a report like this is critical, people question the methodology. And we had a watertight methodology, and to the extent that it was even affirmed when we actually presented it and we're using it in multiple levels. So from a use point of view, it is going to make an impact in the policy direction of IFAD. Thank you, Andy. Right. Thank you, Andrew. That's like a happy, happy end. Thank you, Andrew. And that's fantastic to actually not, you know, get to the end of it, which really for me comes to the big questions in all of this is if we're going to pay attention to environment, not just climate, but the other environmental pressures in all evaluation, is it going to be seen as legitimate? Is that fair to hold people to account for something that wasn't in the design? There's that debate. Is it legitimate? Is it feasible? Can it be done? And I think the examples that we've got here of the climate-focused project show, you know, how, how do you bring in the data and the expertise? So ELAF uh, just happened to come into this with a, a degree in environmental science and a master's in, in uh, climate change and development. Most evaluators don't have that. So what, how, how do we do it in terms of the data and the expertise, the ability to make sense of it? Um, Joanna talked about these collaborative processes, which are massive and huge across all these different departments that, that are being brought in. How do you do that, not just for climate change, but connect that all of the projects to it. So is it feasible is one of the things. And then the third one is, and is it useful? Um, and and Indran has done, provided a nice uh, story in terms of that, that this stuff can be useful. So that they're the, they're the sort of challenges that often seem to come up. What I'd like to do is give you just literally two minutes to just talk to the person next to you about either those issues, you see this as legitimate, feasible, useful, or what are some of the challenges or what are some really hard questions you'd like to come back with? I'm just gonna invite you for two minutes to just speak with the person next to you and then we'll take broader questions. Thank you. Both of your, it's the work that both of you have done is excellent. It's, you know, it's foundational to that probably. Um, I hope you will have an opportunity to continue these discussions over lunch, but I'm also focused on the time and I want to have a chance for you to come back with any comments or questions to the panelists. So can I just, yeah, look at those hands go up. So uh, Fabrizio, I know at the back too. And so, yep. Oh, sorry. Okay. Super, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Moritz Schubert from the Independent Evaluation Section of UNODC. So the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. <laughs> so really a question on the applicability of, uh, of that focus on sustainability in all our evaluations. So um, there's a lot of work, uh, you know, on, on the normative level or um, technical assistance to, let's say, police in certain countries. Um, where I don't see it as evident how to include uh, sustainability questions. There are other projects where there's, for example, infrastructure component included um, where it's more, um, more evident. So I was just wondering, from your perspective, including it um, as kind of a cross-cutting um, criteria in, in all evaluations, would, would that run the risk of making it just a checkbox exercise? Would it be perhaps better to, to really focus on certain project programs that have a more um, clear um, overlap with environment questions, or would it make perhaps sense to, to really look at the sustainability of efforts um, at a more uh, corporate level? Thank you. Good, we'll just hold that question for a minute. I'll just take a couple more 
Fabrizio. Okay. And then at the back. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yep, okay. You're, you're next. Thank you. On the legitimacy of doing, I'm speaking from experience of my organization, I'm Deputy Director of Evaluation at IFAD. On the legitimacy of doing it, uh, looking at the environmental aspect, even for projects designed many years ago, I think it, the answer is yes. And it's more and more accepted by management. In the past, we used to tell the story, oh, but this was designed 10 years ago. I mean, the problem was known 15, 20, 30 years ago. So now the argument is not used anymore because they've learned there's a uh, thick line between defending your, your own work and being ridiculous. So they understood that this, this, they don't want to cross the line anymore. On the feasibility, I think I'm, I'm becoming uh, cautiously optimistic because the data was a problem in the past. Now we have lots of data available almost for free. Uh, on, on internet based, based on machine learning, where you don't need uh, your self expertise to, to uh, analyze the data. You have need expertise to interpret some of the data, but a lot of data are available almost for free. Yeah. And so we, they can include it within your ordinary budget for many evaluation. Not all many, but for many they are. Right. Over. Thanks. Thank you. And there's one more just behind. Yeah. And then we'll have a response to this. Thank you, Patricia Coca, GEI. Um, I'd like to ask uh, what have, have you seen being the most effective way to bring this, um, what you learn from the evaluation back into the project design and how knowledge management has helped and what have you seen as being the most effective? Thank you. So um, there's those three questions. And is it really sensible to do this for all programs or maybe be more focused, um, uh, the value of how, of how we can bring in data. And this is where you might also say, how do we bring in either outside experts where we need them to make sense of that data, or how do evaluators build up some knowledge to be able to make better sense of that data? And then the th third one around, yeah, how do you turn that into action? So uh, Andy, do you want to start with the response? Sure. Um, I, I think the other two panelists have some uh, real insights to contribute to this too, but I'll start. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, drugs are very interesting, uh, a good example. So it's not obvious. I mean, you know, in urban settings, needles lying by the street, et cetera. That's, you know, that's low hanging fruit. But uh, what we say is we don't know. Uh, you need to explore it, and you, we suggest you do it by opening up your theory of change. So you extend, you have your intervention, and extend it wherever it goes in human and natural systems. And then find out where there's intersection, where there's coupling between human and natural systems. And they'll either exist or not exist. If they don't exist, I suggest you return to the opening up and try again. And if they still don't exist, then chances are they're not there within your intervention. But your intervention needs to, to reach, just as you reach you know, drug issues, you reach back to the communities and the problems that are caused in the, in the communities, you need to do that extension. And the worst thing is the, uh, uh, the accountability frames that programs and projects have. And Patricia said, well, gave the example, we don't have the resources, we don't have the authority. What I do is I say, when I'm getting them to open up, I say, I will guarantee you that I will never ever hold you accountable or say you're responsible for achieving these expanded frames. But surely you need to know them. And surely if we can find out about them, it will help you seeking reauthorization or further funding, et cetera, because you'll be at the leader of the pack. No one else is doing it. And so that breaks down the resistance. The fear is accountability, responsibility, and being held responsible for things uh, that aren't there. The, uh, this, the, the second question, uh, yeah, I think we've proved the feasibility. Uh, you know, it's not gonna always be feasible everywhere. Sometimes it's gonna have uh, incremental costs that are larger than we can bear or that we might have to make cuts elsewhere. But I think the, the EFAD evaluation shows that you can blend it in without adding very much extra, without very much incremental cost. And basically, I spent my time, half of my time doing that instead of doing a, a country case study. So 
that's a relatively low cost. There were no additional information gathering. And uh, in terms of knowledge, machine learning and web-based uh, solutions, GIS, et cetera, yeah. I mean, just look at the evaluation office at the at the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, and the tremendous use they make of, of that. And to me, that suggests something that may seem a little startling. Our typical sampling frames are done within the human system. Now, in reality, gender bias, poverty, inequality, supply chain problems exist everywhere. So why don't we try stratifying and drawing our sample on the natural system uh, associated with those things? Because that's often the causal thing. Why don't we sample on the cause instead of the result? Because we'll see the problems everywhere. They're gonna come up. But with that sampling frame, we have a causal story that we can explore as opposed to a sample frame that tries to seek causes. So I, I, think, I think we have the possibility of really shifting evaluations focus and really improving uh, our ability to explain causation and explain solutions. Uh, knowledge management, uh, well, I've suggested one, is using the successes within EFAD that are there and they're important and indisputable. Uh, they should be part of a success-based knowledge management in terms of sustainability within EFAD and much more broadly, certainly with the Rome-based agencies. Um, and but we have to we have to recognize uh, assessments done by uh, UNEG and the Canadian Evaluation Society shows that sustainability and natural systems are present in less than 4% of evaluations done in Canada and globally. They're infinitesimal. So uh, we have to use what knowledge we have and we have to build up that knowledge and sharing. I mean, today you had three presentations of success at doing this. Let's not lose them. Thank you. I've got another question here just before I speak to the... Thank you very much, Andy uh, and colleagues. Uh, fascinating presentations. Just uh, in the spirit of sharing knowledge, uh, because the conference is about that, the importance of integrating natural systems, right? I think we're far away from really doing it systematically. And I was uh, struck by the, the uh, question from Isabel about the baseline. Just want to share with you that in UNDP uh, Evaluation Office now, we have uh, develop a data architecture, data marts, where we have identified some indicators that are significant for each area in which UNDP works. Uh, it's called the signature solutions, and it works on environment as well. So each country program evaluation now has to uh, identify uh, information about some natural systems, uh, annual freshwater withdrawals, uh, terrestrial percentage of terrestrial protected areas, the percentage of uh, forest areas or deforestation, and total greenhouse gas emission. So, how are we using these uh, indicators from the natural systems just to describe the country context? Does it mean that the interventions are addressing directly these issues? Probably not. Right, because are on so many different areas, but the fact that they are forced to reflect what is the status of these natural systems as described in the country context in which the program interventions are taking place, make it relevant to assess those interventions against those indicators to see if the interventions somehow affected positively or negatively the state of the natural systems, right? So it's, I would say a baby step, but into the direction of trying to integrate natural systems with human systems. Thanks. Thank you. And there's just some, some fabulous work going on in different agencies. What I'm really excited about is a chance to both learn from each other and connect to these resources that are there. I just want to offer um, Ilaf and Joanna a chance to comment about your advice, because I think it's nice to frame these as three successes. And, you know, Ilaf, you've had this issue about how do you bring these data and knowledge to people and and Joanna how do you bring together this coordination across the different departments because what we're not saying is that you should double every evaluation budget you know you should run a 
the, the normal evaluation and then you're going to do an, an environmental evaluation as well. Uh, that's not the message. That's just not possible. So what are some things we can learn from the evaluation of environmental programs that can be brought across? So, Ilaf, would, would you have any comments about the sort of data or evidence or how people like me without an environmental science degree might learn some of this? Yeah, I, yeah, I would like to share some um, some point about that. Um, first of all, building capacities of government extension, government extension officers, uh, you have to train them, conduct TOT training sessions, um, writing policy briefs to them uh, to raise their their knowledge about the environment. And also, I would like to share some point about the environmental sustainability. Environmental sustainability is not only um, an environmental sector's responsibility. It is related to different sectors, such as education, economics, development, the public health, tourism, and all, and the list goes on. So if I can. Thank you. And, uh, Joanna, would you, you've had this experience of bringing together all these different parts of government. Uh, what's some advice about how we might do a better job of reaching across the sort of silos within within country governments? Oui, pour commencer, je vais dire que la question climatique c'est une question transversale. Il touche euh, tous les niveaux d'abstention ni la vie d'occupation. Donc, nous avons des ministères <coughs> qui euh, travaillent directement sur les questions du climat. Nous pouvons dire que c'est le ministère des infrastructures et qui les question euh, de l'eau, érosion costière, euh, l'inondation, tout ça, c'est avec eux. Nous avons le ministère de l'Agriculture. Quand il y a de mauvais temps, il touche l'agriculture, il touche euh, l'alimentation de la population et tout ça. Euh, ce sont des exemples. Donc, nous avons des partenaires, partenaires qui travaillent avec nous sur les questions du climat. Ils ont venu chez nous euh, partir de notre appel pour nous aider. Ils nous aider à faire un plan. Mais il y a des plans sectoriels. Et après, il y a un plus grand plan grand qui rajoute toutes ces questions. Et il y a des politiques dans ces plans, les mesures, les programmes. Euh, des activités, des plans d'action, et quel est le ministère qui est euh, responsabilité de quoi faire. Comme nous avons dit, c'est un travail qui n'est pas un travail seulement du ministère. Il est un travail qui inclut tous les niveaux des populations. Et après ça, nous avons des documents grands divisés, chaque plan pour chaque ministère avec sa responsabilité. Et il y a bailleur de fonds, bailleur de fonds, des partenaires. Et chaque a son manière de travailler. Il y a un qui dit, pour vous aider, vous devez, vous doivent euh, remplir tout ça, telle et telle condition. Pour euh, telle ou telle condition, néanmoins d'avoir un montant financier pour vous aider. C'est à partir de ça qui ont faire un rajoutement, un ajuste de compris la, la condition pour que ce partenariat 
peut nous aider à faire de, pour l'adaptation de bon. Et pour euh, implémenter les mesures, né? l'adaptation, la surveillance. Et dire encore que nous sommes euh, tout le moment en liaison avec ces partenaires. Il y a des moments qui euh, nous envoient des spécialistes pour l'approchement, voir bien comme, comment les choses vivent ne sont pas seulement le travail du cabinet, mais nous sortons aussi sur le terrain pour voir comment les choses se passent, si l'investissement correspond à la vérité, qu'est-ce que nous attendons. Mais il y a aussi la question que l'on pose des données. Ces données sont dans la plateforme. Il est objet de discussions au niveau, au niveau du gouvernement, hein, du conseil des ministres et aussi de l'Assemblée nationale. Et les partenaires suivent tout le moment comment les effets sont, sont aboutis. Merci. Thank you. That's a oh. That's um, very helpful to look at the not only how do you do the planning, but how do you keep reviewing the implementation? How do you collaborate around the uh, the monitoring and the evaluations? And fundamentally, how do you use it to make differences? Um, and my apologies to everyone for me not managing the time as well as I ought. I want to thank all the panelists for uh, a fantastic. Um, presentation. Could you just give them an applause for a moment, please? Thank you for that. Um, and please, let's discuss it. That's really one of the issues that we want to come out of this work. Um, the work that Andy and I have been involved in is um, being shared through the Better Evaluation platform, um, and we're very keen to connect with people who are working on it, who have other resources that should be shared through that. And I think the challenge for us all is to find um, some practical ways to go forward to make the sort of changes we need to quickly enough. So I invite you all to join in that. Thank you very much.